Well, welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 338. And this time, I am delighted to be talking about this record, a wonderful record by the Curtis Counts Group from 1957 on Contemporary, a real highlight of their catalog. And this is a first mono pressing. This record is sometimes released as landslide, and all later pressings actually have this image reversed so that Curtis is actually on the left-hand side of the picture as opposed to the right. In terms of what to expect, well, if you've been paying attention to this channel, you'll have noticed a bit of a West Coast theme in recent months. And this is another West Coast record, but with a real difference. The book on West Coast jazz, at least from the perspective of East Coast critics at the time, was largely that it was more heavily arranged, more overtly compositional, more effete than the East Coast hard bop found on labels like Prestige, Riverside, and Blue Note. The trouble with that narrative is that a substantial minority of contemporary records releases, and recall contemporary was the most significant label of all the West Coast labels, don't fall under the cool jazz heading, but are really more straightforward hard bop. And they include records by people like Sonny Rollins, Art Farmer, and Benny Golson. Now, those records were made by East Coast hard bop stars in conjunction with a whole bunch of West Coast sidemen. And some of those records were made in New York, like the Farmer and Golson records. This one stands apart from all of those because it's a solidly hard bop record made on the West Coast by an all LA group. Curtis Counts was born in January 1926 in Kansas City, Missouri. His early experimentation with musical instruments included the violin and the tuba before he eventually settles on the string bass. And at age 16, he gets his first professional gig and he goes on the road with the Nat Tolls band. He then played for three years with Edgar Hayes, and then in 1945, he goes out to L.A. and he gets a job with Johnny Otis's orchestra playing at the famous Club Alabam on Central Avenue. His recording career begins in 1946 when he's on a Lester Young side. By the 1950s in L.A., he's established himself as a go-to first-call bassist and session man, and he makes records and performs with all kinds of people, including Shorty Rogers, Stan Kenton, Shelley Mann, Lyle Murphy, Teddy Charles, and Clifford Brown. In the early 50s, opportunities in jazz in L.A. were very much segregated according to color. But Counts was a bit of an exception. He was one of the few black jazz musicians to get acceptance and a lot of work out of the Hollywood studios, possibly or probably because of his fairly fortuitous connection with very well-connected players and impresarios like Shorty Rogers and Stan Kenton. When he was with Kenton's orchestra, he got to tour Europe in 1956. Coming back from that tour, he resolved on the basis of all of experience to start his own band in the late summer of that year. The Curtis Counts group only existed in its greatest form for about two years, and the core of it was Curtis Counts on bass, a drummer Frank Butler, Harold Land, the tenor saxophonist, fresh from his time with Max Roach and Clifford Brown, piano player Carl Perkins, and the trumpeter Jack Sheldon. Despite Counts being the nominal leader, the surviving members of the band remember it being a very democratic outfit and very tightly knit. They formed in August of 1956, and their first gig was a month later at The Hague, that little tiny jazz club in L.A., in September. And soon after that, within about a month, they had an offer of a record deal from Les Koenig at Contemporary Records. It was hardly a gamble for Koenig. He liked the sound of the club, but more to the point, he knew Counts to be an excellent and reliable session guy. He'd already played on records that Koenig had recorded by Shelley Mann and Lyle Murphy, and over 15 months beginning in 1957, the Curtis Counts group recorded enough material for contemporary for four records, falling pretty much squarely in the hard bop lane with a little bit of a flavor of cool jazz. This record was the first release. It was followed fairly shortly thereafter by You Get More Bounce with Curtis Counts, one of the most famous slash infamous record covers in the contemporary catalog. A third record, Carl's Blues, was recorded but not released until 1960, and there was still some additional material which remained in the vault of contemporary until after Les Koenig's death, when the producer Ed Michel was given the authority to go through contemporary's vaults and see what he could find. And to his delight, he found a whole record's worth of material, which was subsequently released as Sonority in 1989. The two initial records, when released, were reviewed very well. But the group sadly hit a real wall in the spring of 1958 when Carl Perkins, whose piano playing really tied the whole sound of the group together, died of a drug overdose shortly after playing on a solo record by Harold Land called Grooveyard, which actually features most of the players on this record. I mentioned the group was quite tightly knit. The death of Perkins is a huge blow. After a while, they soldier on with Elmo Hope in the piano chair. They make one more record in 1958 for a small LA label called Duto Records called Exploring the Future with a slightly novel looking cover. That record has the Swede Rolf Erickson substituting in for Jack Sheldon on trumpet. But then that's it. The group winds up. 
and counts his own career can really be divided into pre and post Carl Perkins death. In the five years before Perkins dies, he has, I think, something like 80 to 85 different recording credits. In the five years after, he has 12. And what's more, the records he was on beforehand were often really top ranked records, a lot of great sessions, and the 12 recordings he makes later are in general not nearly as notable. Count's career decline is a bit mysterious. Clearly, he was affected by Perkins' death, given his output afterwards, and he, of course, names their next record, the one which was delayed until 1960, after Perkins, the one that's called Carl's Blues. And I don't think you can say his career stalled for a lack of critical acclaim. They certainly got lots of acclaim for their first two records. It might have to do with the fact that they were quite reluctant to tour. Apparently, they never toured further east than Denver. It may also have been health-related, because after this flurry of recordings that the different iterations of the group made in 1957-1958, the group breaks up, Counts continues to work, but he fades pretty rapidly from the scene, and in 1963, very sadly, he dies of a heart attack at only 37. This record is made on two dates, October 8th and October 15th, 1956, at Contemporary Studios in L.A., with Les Koenig producing and Roy Dunan handling the engineering. Curtis Counts is on bass, Harold Land is on tenor sax. I mentioned that he'd been with the Brown Roach Quintet, which at that time, in the mid-50s, was going great guns, but he'd had to move back to L.A. to look after his wife, who'd fallen ill. Jack Sheldon's on trumpet, and he's got quite a story. He was a guy from Florida. He had spent some time in the Air Force, and after he got out of the Air Force, he was playing around the L.A. scene with people like Art Pepper, Wardell Gray, Dexter Gordon, and Herb Geller. He appears on a number of Jimmy Jeffrey records, and he also makes his own record as a leader for Jazz West. After the Curtis Counts group broke up, he continued to record into the 60s, but he also starred in a sitcom, I think a short-lived one, called Run, Buddy, Run. He was a regular on the Merv Griffin Show, and here's a piece of trivia. He's the voice of the Bill in the Schoolhouse Rock cartoon, I'm Just a Bill. Carl Perkins, at this point, had a wonderful career beckoning as a hard bop piano player. He taught himself on the piano. He had this peculiar style where he had his left forearm kind of parallel to the keyboard, thanks to a childhood illness. That helped him voice the bass chords, and even after he grew to adulthood, he maintained that style. And one of the real sort of unheralded gems of this record is a then-unknown Frank Butler, who had played with Dave Brubeck and Ellington at this point in his career, but he'd never been recorded before he steps into the studio to make this record. When the recording session started, Koenig and Dunan were very impressed with the chemistry of the group, and perhaps the clearest manifestation of that is the fact that every single track on here is a first take. Side one starts with Landslide, subsequently used as the title of later issues. This begins with a flurry of notes from Sheldon and then some absolutely wonderful playing from Land. But be prepared to be super impressed with the bluesy touch and feel of Perkins and really, frankly, the playing of everybody in this track. Time After Time is a luxurious ballad with Land and Sheldon kind of softening the edge, which they had found on the first track. The final track on side one is Kenny Clark's Sonar, which has a very kind of West Coast cool sounding head arrangement, which is kind of ironic, given that the track is written by one of the original stars of the bebop movement. There's an opportunity here for Counts to stretch out, and then Butler offers this drum solo, which just hints at the fireworks to come on side two. Side two begins with Mia, written by Perkins. It features his feathery touch and also Counts' fierce walking bass. And then we have Jack Sheldon's Sarah, the longest track on a record made up of long tracks. The whole track is killer. My favorite parts are Land solo and Sheldon solo. Counts also has a solo here. My only beef with his whole record is that Counts' bass is not captured particularly well at points in this record. Not what you'd expect from contemporary. The last track is a fifth for Frank, and it's basically a vehicle for some stupendous playing by Butler, who, recall, has never been in a recording studio to make a record until this album. It's one of the most rhythmic and musical drum solos you're ever going to hear, and Butler's technical ability here is incredible. He switches from sticks to hands to knuckles and back again seamlessly. It's amazing. In the last few years, I have spent some time gathering a reasonably complete collection of contemporary releases from the 1950s and 1960s. So I can say from experience, if not from authority, that this record is one of the greatest records that label ever released. It's also a record of 46 minutes worth of music on it by my count, which is a bargain. It's worth getting any of Curtis Counts' records for contemporary, in my view, and this is probably the place to start. For me, it's four and a half out of five stars.